Oh, Habitat 101. <laughs> My, the first bird I ever carved was in a class in Missoula, Montana. And a guy named John Austin, who's now my best friend, he got me started on bird carving. And I went in with a Fordham, with the, no, a Dremel flex shaft. And <laughs> that's how I started. And I had no experience, and this is the first habitat that I ever did, was with John in Montana. And he's, he's the one that got me started on songbird carving. I fell in love with it as soon as I picked up my first bird. But this is brass tubing. You know what this is, cattail. So <laughs> but this is, a, this is probably about a full-sized one, maybe a little bit less than a full-sized. And this is hollow brass tubing is what this is on this one. And then this is this thin brass. You can get it at Hobby Lobby or you can get it at um, places that do machining. They call it shim stock. And that's what this brass is from. The Hobby Lobby is where this came from. But that's what I make the leaves with. And this one, though, like I said, this is a hollow brass tubing here. And with the hollow brass tubing, if you want to make a real long one of these, you can slide one size tubing in another size tubing. So that's how you can get these brass tubings. You can get them, you can make stuff this long if you want with hollow brass tubing. But the solid stuff only comes in like two foot pieces. So that's the trick if you want to make these bigger. But I'm going to demonstrate a smaller version of the cattail right here. This is my wife's idea. She said make it sized so people can, if they're doing a fish, you know, you can make some small ones. Like if you had a little fish display, you can make some of these. That'd look kind of cool. But the little fish, that <laughs> this is look kind of stupid, but the little fish about this big. You know, so this is like a, a third size down of what this was. So now this one is eighth inch brass rod for the main stem. And this is just a piece of uh, basswood I had laying around. Just a, it's a half inch by half inch chunk of basswood. I think it's a little under three inches long. And then I used eighth inch uh, dowel rod, like from Menards or hardware store. You know that dowel rod you can buy for 39 cents. That's all this is. That's what this whole thing is. So first thing I do is I put this on. <laughs> Just carve the edges off this. Well, one thing you do want to do, though, when I took this class, we made these perfectly straight. And it, it just doesn't look right. It doesn't look real. Because when you look at these actual punks on a cattail, there's a chunk missing. They're a little curved. You know? So what you want to do in anything you do in habitat, you never want to make it straight. Just like a songbird. You know, like when you carve a songbird, first thing they do on a lot of classes, they'll have you drill the eyes in first. That's the last thing I do. Because that's a set point in the bird. So you're going to carve everything exact to that area and the bird looks dead, you know, because it's too symmetrical. You know, in nature, it's not symmetrical. So when you, even on little things like this, on this little cattail punk here, I'll, you could draw a little, I, I don't draw stuff on there, I just carve it, but I carve a little curve in it. I'll take these two corners off and I'll take the center out here. So when I carve that, I'll just start a little curve going there. And then I'll card these corners off. Get that junk out of the way. So I'll just take the corners off quick. That's good. Oh, missed one. Okay, next thing I'll do is on, this is a cuts all bit. You know, I'm sure you've, people are familiar with them. I'll get rid of this glove though. Never power carve with the glove on. <laughs> get rid of that. And I'll just take a cuts all bit and I'll take the corners off this and get it reasonably round. So 
when you carve this, though, you don't have to get it perfectly round because if you look at actual cattails, they're not perfectly round. They've got dimples and divots and flaws. That's good enough, and I'll just round the ends over a little bit. Okay, get the other end. I don't put any holes in this until I'm totally done carving the uh, main punk part. If you put the holes in first, like if you wanted to put it in the center of the wood like you would naturally do, then by the time you carve a little shape into it, your holes are going to be incorrect. So I get the shape first. Well, it's kind of crude, but I'm going to call it good enough. Okay. Now, if I was at home, I'd be switching to a uh, sanding disc. You know, one of these ones that hold sandpaper, these mandrills, only a bigger one. But here, this is a nice little one, nice little handy one for small stuff. So now I'm going to get it reasonably smooth. Kind of finish the shape on it. Best thing about Habitat is you can use up all those little scraps of wood laying around. You know, <laughs> it's just nothing. You know, I usually use whatever junk from blanks I'm cutting out. That's what I wind up using for this stuff. There, we'll call that good. Okay, so the next thing I'll do, I'll see how I carved it. Can I've got a little bit of a curve to it. I don't know if you can see that. I like to carve everything on a curve or a slant, you know, not straight up. So when I take my awl, this is, just, this is a finished nail that I ground down on a grinder and it's just a hunk of wood laying on the shop floor. It took me 10 minutes to make it, you know, so I'll just cram that thing in there. See about at the angle of the flow? See that? That's yeah, looking pretty close. Cut me off a chunk of this eighth inch here. And I don't carve this until I stick it in. On the class I took, he used solid brass for the tip. But I like using a piece of wood instead of brass so you can shape it. You can shape it real nice. You can get a curve to this. You can taper it easily. Just stick that sucker in there. Now in the real world, I'd probably glue this, but we'll call it good. Okay, so there we go. Looks like corn dog at the fair, sort of. Okay. Now that's probably a little bit long. Okay. So now I'll change my carving bit to uh, like a little ruby flame or, you know, whatever you like to carve with. I like this little ruby bit a lot. It's a really good bit. And the same thing. I'll try and carve this tip with the flow of the cattail I'm making. So you can see how it goes. You know, it slants that way, so I'm going to want to take off this top edge right away. Get that out of the way. See, now that I took it off this side, I want to take the middle out, start the flow going to one direction. And I carved the shape first to get the flow before I round it on the other opposing sides, you know what I mean? So I'll carve this plane and this plane, get it shaped how I want, and then I'll kind of round these sides over. If you start rounding everything all at once, you'll lose perspective on what you're doing. So I just work on two sides at once. See how that's getting a pretty decent little shape to it and a decent little curve? Okay. Now, if you look at it this way, <laughs> it's just flat. You know, so now I'll carve those two sides. But I won't taper these because I'll just carve these from wide to thin, you know, from top to bottom. Because I already have the shape. I want on the one, one direction that it's going to flow. So 
if you're doing this, you'd probably want to glue that in place. I just shoved it in to save time, but uh, a little bit of woodworking glue or the super glue. I try not to use that when I'm power carving because when you use super glue and you power carve, it gives off a poisonous gas actually when you carve it with power. With knife, you can do it, but not with power. So I would use a woodworking glue on this. Okay, that's getting a reason. I'll stop here. I, would, I could work on that another 10, 15 minutes probably. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I guess I can't stop. When you're power cutting, you gotta remember the direction too. I've got this turning this way. If I run it around the tip, it'll wrap around and rip the tip off. So on this thing, I can reverse it. So now it's turning the opposite direction and I can run the bit up without it wrapping around the tip. You know what I mean? So if you get the bit turned the wrong way, you go around the tip, you'll just tear it right off. I try and remember that when I'm doing bird beaks. Which direction? Because when you carve a bird beak, you'll do Reverse it one way and go forward in the other direction. Depends which side of the beak you're carving. Well, you'll rip the schnoz right off that bird. Okay, we're gonna call that good. So, see how that's reasonably shaped? You know, it's getting kind of a neat looking form to it. So the next thing I do is I take my wood burner fire this dude up. Now, my, I don't know if many people wood burn here, you know, but if, you, if you're wood burning, when you buy tips, the first thing you gotta do is sharpen them so you can carve with them. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. I, I sharpen this. I can actually, with it off, I can carve with this. It's that sharp. I'll, I'll take a curl right off. Because when you, and then you have to polish them. Because when you don't polish a tip, when you go to burn feathers, uh, feathers on a bird or whatever you're doing, it will, you won't get good flow through the wood. So the first thing you do, they never come sharp, ever. You always have to tweak them. So anyway, this is all sharpened up. And then uh, where's, here's the deal I was working on. And then what I'll do is I'll take this and I'll burn lines. And I support the piece I just inserted, like on a block of wood or something, just like that. Okay. And then I'll just burn in. First of all, I should see. Hey, there it is. And I'll, you can burn lines on, and then it'll be like growth lines. It's amazing the difference that makes. You know, when you don't, I'll, I'll carve, I'll burn on lines on one side, and I'll leave them off on another. And you can see the difference it makes and how much better this is going to look. Because in habitat, it's all this fine stuff that makes the difference, like all these little details that makes the whole thing. Okay, now, one thing I did forget, I'm going to take this out. Before you insert that, we're going to go backwards. After I sanded that, I get it reasonably smooth. You know, I didn't get it like I'd want it, because it's a demo, but when you get it how you want it and a little curve to it, they call this Mr. Bumpy. You know, my big cuts all for the Fordham that rips your hand off if you miss, you know. <laughs> That's a big one. But this is the size cuts all I would use. You'd roll it down this to put the dimpling effect that these punks have. It's kind of the only way I found to do it. So, but for, see, the size of the teeth on that, they're gigantic. This is a smaller version, so I take the smaller cuts all size. This is a cuts all cylinder. And I'll roll it with like the direction of the grain of what I carved. So I'll just roll it down here. <coughs> I wrote that on an instruction sheet. Make sure you don't have this in a Fordham running. <laughs> 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 this is how this is what I mean. <laughs> This is how you want to do it. I'll only do half of it. You can see the difference. I'll pass it around when I'm done with this. Shove that guy back in there. Looks about right. So that's how you get the texture that's required for this to look reasonably decent. You know, because we're trying to imitate nature and it's so hard to do. You know, so that's one trick to get the 
design on there for the cattail. The next thing I do, take a piece of this eighth inch brass rod, and this is gonna support a bird. So, same thing, look at the flow of my piece here. Take my awl, try not to stick myself in the hand. I've gotta sit down or I'll impale myself here. That looks pretty good. And I'll bend it kind of how I think I want this to look. Go like that a little. Stick that in there. That's not right. I think we'll turn it this way. There we go. See how that's getting some flow to it now? You know, it's not just straight. It's got some style to it. You know, even if you don't carve it perfect or make everything look exact like you want it. If you have a good flow to it, you know, it's forgiving then, you know. So that's what you want. Okay. So I'm going to take my punk off. And what I'll do now is I'll change to a stone I don't like. I won't use my good ruby bit. I'll change to just a cheap stone here. Fire this dude up. And I'll just rough this up. And I'm roughing it up so when I solder, when I go to paint it, it'll stick to it. This stuff is so slippery. And if you go to move it, if you don't rough it up, paint's gonna come off. You know, so I just rough this guy up a little bit. I've done it with sandpaper, but I like the way a stone works better. And sandpaper will work if you use a coarse enough grit, but I like this better. This gets a little nicer job. Okay. So, what we've got is roughed up piece of brass, ready to solder or paint. So, we're ready to go. So now, we'll make a leaf. This strap leaf like cattails have. So what I'll do is I'll take some of this brass here I'll just cut a chunk out. So what I'm doing is I cut a piece of brass. You gotta make sure you leave a tab on it. And this tab is what you're gonna wrap around the brass to hold your leaf in place. Cut sort of a shape to it that I want. These are just scissors from the dollar store. We'll shape it this way a little more. But if you're doing, you can use anything. I've had shim stock that somebody got me from uh, a paper mill that closed down and it's thicker and it worked fine. But the thicker the stock is, like if this was twice as thick, you would probably have to detemper it so you could work it. This stuff works good even tempered because you know, it's so thin, you know, and it shapes easily. This is nice stuff. We're getting close. See how I just, just cut a tapered leaf? Nothing, not rocket science. That's a pretty decent shape I'm getting there. Okay, so now, where's my scotch bright? So I just kind of run it, run it along here, and take some of the shine off of it. And then I'll take the scotch bright and clean up this uh, little tab so the solder will stick well. Okay, so that's what we've got. Okay, so now I'll take my piece of brass and I will take some soldering paste. You're gonna get it at Menards. It's just what they use for plumbing. And a soldering brush, I always make sure I identify it so I don't start painting with it. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> Doesn't work too well. So I always, I'm using a solder that I got at Radio Shack. It's, see how fine it is? It's electrical, electronic solder. And it works real well. It's 60-40. Uh, it's this is like 40% lead. It works the best, this lead solder. You don't want to use the silver stuff because when you're doing delicate stuff like this, you got to get it too hot and everything falls apart when you get it too hot because the metal, you could have like a bird up here with toes or other things and you're soldering down here 
<laughs> and he travels really well on metal. And all of a sudden you're down, wow, that's coming out cool, and boom, everything <laughs> falls off that you spend three hours on. I'll put some soldering flux right on this dude. Yeah, you probably don't even have to put it on the tube. So I've got soldering flux right on here. Wrap that around. If I was at home, I'd spend probably 15 minutes on this, getting this tab right. You know, I just don't have time here. Okay. That's reasonably good. I'll put a little more flux, flux on here. This is flux core solder, and the guy that showed me how to do all this, he said, no matter if you got flux core solder or not, you still use flux. That's how you, you know, you know what? I forgot a step. <laughs> we should put the veins in here. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. You know, all leaves, all these leaves have veins in them. On this bigger one, you can see them. You got the veins in there. You can use a piece, this is vinyl flooring, just junk we had laying around, or you can use newspaper. Just something that has a little give behind it. You can use the back of a dental pick, but what I did, I like this better. I took a large finish nail, cleaned it up on the grinder, and then I buffed the end so it was kind of smooth, and it's easy to, excuse me, easy to hold, and it puts a nice vein in. So you just press down, I do the center vein first. You want to get the center vein pretty deep, and what that's going to do, it's going to start cupping the leaf so it looks natural. There's one vein put in. I usually put in three on these. Now let's stick her back to where I was started here. Slide her back on here. See, this has two on it, but to me, that's too busy. I don't like that, actually. You know, but I did this first carving, first habitat. So I'll just stick one on this guy. I'll just heat this up. That gets hot quick. Done. Right now, that's pretty hot up here. You know, so mostly when I do my habitat, I use a 25 watt soldering iron. So that's that. You know, and then, I don't know, I put some, sh whatever you think you want to do on it. Put a little curve on it. You can twist it. That's starting to get some shape to it. Got my little, so that's where we're at. Next thing I do is uh, flex paste. When this is done, this is kind of sloppy. This one's a little better. But when this is properly done, the cattail leaf, you'll see the line here, of where, right where my thumb finger is. You know, that looks natural. But below this, this line isn't there on the actual cattail. You know, so you got to cover this up, this, uh, where this tab ends. And it's like a, it's really neat stuff. It's like a paste, but it's acrylic. But when it hardens, you can carve it. When you put it on brass, it sticks great. This is the best stuff I've ever found. And I, I, I did this the other day, and it takes a, about an hour to harden. And once it's hardened, I probably would build up another layer there. And then you can smooth this off so the transition from this little tab disappears. Then after that, but this is um, Krylon. You know, eat, I used to use 1301, but I found crystal clear. It's all about the same stuff, I think. And what I'll do is I'll seal the wood portions of this, not the brass. And the reason for that is when I start painting this, if I don't seal this, it's going to suck. Like I'm putting burn umber on this or brown. It's going to suck it in, and it's all going to be brown. You know, there's going to be no light shining through it. You know, just it'll look dead. So I'll take a little bit of burn umber, which I set out up here. Here's the one I sealed. And I'm not dumping it on, but I'm lightly working, uh, working it in. Like I said, the worst thing you can do is just dump paint on, because then you lose any life that's coming through underneath. So see how that guy's starting to look a little better? They're starting to get the proper color, but you don't want to put it on too thick, because see, some of the wood is still coming through. And if you look at the pictures here, and you look at a cattail, they're this burnt umber color, but you can still see the white coming through. Okay. So see, that's starting to get a decent color to it. So right now, you don't want to overdo it on paint. You just want to build up small layers, 
in small layers so stuff looks good. Okay, I'll clean this up. And you kind of, I don't have a cattail in front of me, but I kind of paint as I go, what colors I see in there, you know. But I'm thinking like raw sienna would look good on this. You know, so take a little bit of raw sienna, which is basically a uh, dark yellow, is raw sienna. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically a dark yellow, you know. And I'll like the tip, I'll put a little bit of raw sienna on there. If I was at home, I'd be doing this with my airbrush. You know, but I did airbrushes are a hassle to doing a demo, so I didn't bring it. But those these are the same colors I'd be using. So see how that raw sienna started giving that tip a nice color? And what's cool about the brass, and see I already have the raw sienna color already started here. You know, so if I want to brown it up, or, yeah, I'd probably want to give it a flesh tone next. You know, what I usually do is I have one in front of me when I'm painting, an actual cattail, or if I'm carving a bird, I have a dead bird in front of me, you know, that I have taken notes from at a nature center. So, paint some of this on there, and I just keep building up colors. I mean, you can paint it anything you want, you know. But that's what I do. That's how I, and then for the speckle effect, if you look at a cattail, like on, on this one here, see the little speckles? When you look at actual cattails, that's a water mold is what that is. There's water mold dots all over these things. So what we do to get that effect is you take a brush that's really not a good one, like this one, Cut off the bristles. That's about right. See how I cut them bristles off so they're stiffer? Then I'll just, I'll take black to make it easy. This is Mars black, but basically black. This gets messy. <laughs> And when you get the under colors you want, you splatter a little bit on there because there's too much going on there with the toothbrush. You know, it's too long and flat. This I can control really well. And these are 10 cents. They're really cheap. Yeah, I won't use a $14 brush doing this. I don't know if you can see that, but see, I've got little speckles of black everywhere, just like the mold that grows on a cattail in the swamp. <laughs> I guess that's it. 